Today we're making an absolutely fabulous app that I like to call Romba, which is available and if you want to play it, you can head on over to the Google Play Store. Of course you need Android, I'm not paying for any app store license. Too expensive! But yeah, let's roll an intro, then take a look into the actual game. So the game is actually really, really cool. You work your way up a vertical kind of thing with heaps of barriers there. And of course there's stuff for you to collect. Of course you're trying to get as many points as you can. The speed starts to increase. The colors start changing to everything. And then you got all these bright colors and la 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 la. It's an endless runner basically meaning you can go forever. But of course it does get very, very hard once the speed starts to increase. And there was a few little changes I made to this one in comparison to the previous game that I did not know necessarily. The entire game took about three days to actually create. Well, you can kind of compress that down to one day because it definitely took less than 24 hours to actually make it. It's just I started working over it over a period of time. Well, let's get to the first thing that you guys are probably interested in, which is, I'm gonna guess, the movement of things, which is pretty smooth, pretty cool. Basic idea of movement is that you need to tap the screen and hold it in order to get the little rhombus thingy to actually follow your finger. Now, the way I did this was to use translate instead of our previous game where I used vector3.move towards. This time I used this.transform.translate, and then of course within the brackets you put in the direction, which I called vector2.up, and of course you put in the speed, which I called speed, and then of course I times the entire thing by time dot delta time so that when we actually set our speed we can set it to one two three four five instead of having 0 0.01 because the speeds were incredibly fast anyway that in itself is how you actually get movement now i want it to move to a very specific direction also following my finger so the way i did this was to actually set the position of rotation to create this thing your character actually rotates towards the direction of your finger now it doesn't change the position of anything but because we're moving to the vector two dot up which is the up Upwards direction of our character, we're just rotating the upwards direction to face our finger. I made sure to check that the input or touch position was actually above the character so that we do not have people moving backwards and stuff like that. So it's always going to travel upwards. This way we get very, very smooth movement towards things. We change the rotation of our character to face something rather than changing our actual move position to move it towards our finger. Take into account that there are many, many, many ways to do this, and this is most definitely not the only way. Now, of course, the part where you're creating your endless level basically I just made a barrier it's just a piece of pixel string it's a very very small image which I've just enlarged and of course made it made it into a point filter so that everything is not so blurry we now have very very defined edges I went and added two box colliders one to either side of the barrier of course put this on another game object setting it as the child object so our visuals and our box colliders are actually part of a child object then of course we can move these barriers to very specific positions so that we can get different positions but all spawning on the exact same X axis. As we travel up the level it's setting it to the exact same X position and the exact same Y position relative to the previous spot. This basically makes our job a lot easier. We're not choosing random positions. There is just whatever obstacles we have available. It's going to spawn in the exact same spot but we save three game objects with different positions for these barriers. Meaning you can get random positions anyway but instead of choosing a random position it's choosing a random game object which has a different position. If you want to know how to grab a random object basically you create an array, drag and drop all your objects into that array and then of course in your script go random dot range within the square brackets of course the range at what we wanted is the amount of game objects that we have and this can basically be said as zero to start with and of course ending with our array dot length awesome now we have random objects spawning at different positions for each one relative to the previous position of course for each barrier on the script we also want to check to make sure that we are not too low in order to keep ourselves alive so I determined that there was about four meters or four in-game units before you actually get the barrier barriers to exit the screen, which means that we can go ahead and check whether or not we are four meters away from our actual character. In order to get this, we cannot judge distance because if we are judging distance, it could apply to both positions, both Y positions, up and down. So the way we check this is to check whether or not the barriers transform position dot Y is less than the player's position dot Y minus a certain amount of numbers before it exits the screen. Then of course you run destroy brackets, this dot game object, you're sorted. So every time you pass a barrier, you get a point. How do we do this? Well, there is an invisible game object actually present every single time this spawns a barrier. So every single game object for the obstacles actually has a little goal uh, game object attached to it somewhere. And of course, if you collide with that, it's going to get rid of the goal game object at a point, And then of course, continue on your day. Nothing much changes because our goal is separate as a child component to the barriers. So our obstacles are our parent, And then of course we have barriers underneath. And then of course, 
course, underneath that one, we have our goal. It's a very strange hierarchy, but it actually works very well because you need the barriers to have the goal and you need the obstacle to have the barriers. Not too sure if that makes much sense in your guys' head, but it certainly made sense in my head. Of course, we use tags in order to get what we are colliding with so that we can get some decent collisions in there. Of course, if we collide with something tagged with the word death, we will die. So they're very, very simple deaths within this game. It's basically destroy this dot game object. Then of course we instantiate a particle that we made which is full of little colours because we don't really know what colour we are going to be at the single time and of course we can always change this. I mean it's nice and polished up, it works very well. There's not much else we need really. What more do you want? Just spawn a particle system every single time you die, reset the level. Of course, if you start resetting the level so many times, then we can run an ad or two. This is the first game of this year where I've put advertising into the actual game. So hopefully we make a little bit of revenue there. Not too sure whether or not it will do well, but it's always a gamble whenever you're chucking something on the App Store or Android. Google Play! not the app store. Camera tracking. Why does the camera actually follow the character? Well, I use something that I use in almost every single game when I want to track a character, Vector2.lerp, or Vector3.lerp if we are making a 3D game. Vector2.lerp is very, very simple. All you need to do is insert your transform.position, and then of course the target's transform.position, and then of course a speed at which to track it at, or which to damp it at. It's actually very, very smooth, which is incredibly important because we want nice smooth movements with our camera. So we travel up into our nice, awesome world we have a, an incredibly smooth camera of course you set the x position to stay the same because you don't want it tracking the actual player's x position you just want it tracking its y position so you create a temporary variable which is a random vector 2 or a new vector 2 and then of course we set the x position to always be 0 and then set, set the y position to be the same as our character therefore we are not moving side to side with our actual character we are just moving up and down well not even down we're just moving up because we are using the translate function, I cannot actually attach the camera to the game object or it will af be affected by almost everything you're applying to that game object. Example, rotation. We don't really want rotation on our camera, although it might work. That's a weird thing. Maybe time to change that, actually. I kind of want to see what it happens. <laughs> now we move on to the actual UI and scoring system. Now, of course, I just changed the text colors in order to get the romba words actually changing colors. It just kept changing to a random color. And then, of course, smoothing that color using color.lerp. Color.lerp is just like vector2.lerp. It basically changes it from one color to another with a very, very smooth movement in between. This, my friends, is how we get these nice changing colors to be very, very smooth. And, of course, we have something like a score system that actually is in the back of everything. How do you you get UI in the back of your actual game objects in the front. I've actually got a few messages on Discord before about these specific things, so hopefully this helps you guys out. So for this one, I didn't use NGUI, I just used Unity's default GUI system, and the, basically the way that you do this is to create your text as you usually would, and then of course we are going to go to our canvas, and we are going to set how our camera is actually overlaying the entire image. So we go down and change our render mode to screen space dot camera, which basically sets it to the camera instead of this massive canvas that extrudes way beyond what we really need. Of course, set your renderer camera, and then you're going to notice that you're going to need to set the sorting layer to be behind all the sprites that you are creating. So the order in your sorting layer I set to negative four because nothing in my game goes beyond negative four. So basically, all you have is this nice background color with some text in the background, which I faded out, so it's not taking too much attention away from you. Plus, it's not getting a little bit intrusive with the actual screen. It's very, very subtle, but you can read it whenever you want. Then, of course, high scores are saved using player preferences. Easy to hack, but who really cares? Because if you are going to hack a high score of this game, you're, it's a little bit sad. So in order to get this, we run an if statement upon death to check whether or not we have actually got a higher score than our high score. If we have, very, very simple, we go int, and then we go create a string, we can call it high score, and then of course we set it to our current score. It of course resets the screen, and then voila, we are done, we have made it easy. Hopefully you guys are all inspired to go out there and create your own games. Very, very simple process. And of course, start with something simple. I don't know why, but I feel like doing these simple games are helping me a lot more than trying to do these complicated games. And I don't, I, I, I can't explain it. I'm easily pushing through them so fast. And I'm hoping that by the end of this year, I do have 52 games to show for this year. Should be fun. In personal news, I may actually transfer gaming stuff onto this. I don't like the way that this channel is going with so much mess, you know. I just want it to be one video every single week. Then, of course, I want to do gaming Monday through to Friday. And then, of course, use Saturday and Sunday to actually create the videos for this channel. I don't know if it's a good idea. If you think it's a good idea and you made it this far through the video, then just tell me. If you don't, I don't know. Leave something that says no. Anyway, thank you very much for watching, guys. And I'll see you next week with another how to make a game tutorial. 
Kind of. It's not a tutorial. I barely taught you anything. We're just flashing a whole bunch of stuff in your face, showing you how easy it is to actually make a game, and then saying goodbye.